Welcome to Philosophy and Critical Thinking, The Basics. In our last video, we discussed deconstructing straw men and the principle of charity. In this video, we're going to talk about inference to the best explanation and abductive reasoning. So let's look at this argument here. Premise 1, my car is not here. Therefore, conclusion 2, my car has been stolen. So this abductive reasoning is we're trying to explain something. So we're considering the fact that my car is not here. I've gone to go get my car and I've noticed it's not here. And this needs an explanation. And so our conclusion works as the explanation that my car has been stolen. In a bit of philosophical jargon, you don't really need to know this, but it's worthy knowing if you do start to read some arguments that involve abductive reasoning. When we have the thing that needs explaining, which is that my car is not here, that's called the explanandum. That's the technical term for the, the thing that needs explaining. The explanation or the conclusion that my car has been stolen is the explanands. And the explanands is the thing that does the explaining. So we can see from the previous argument that was clearly invalid because there could be plenty of reasons why the car is not here and that my car has not been stolen. Um, I could have my spouse may have taken it for a drive or um, there, uh, so, um, I might have parked it somewhere else and I'd forgotten about it. There's, there's plenty of other explanations. That isn't the only explanation. So some people will, or some philosophers, will try and come to the correct explanation by making the argument valid. And this is one approach. My car is not here, premise one. Premise two, the correct explanation for this is that my car has been stolen. Therefore, conclusion three, my car has been stolen. But this begs the question because it, we can't accept the second premise that the correct explanation is that my car has been stolen without already accepting the conclusion that my car has been stolen. So uh, this is a problem if you're going to take this approach. So um, I prefer another approach, which is called inference to the best explanation, which comes next. So inference to the best explanation can work in this way. Premise one, my car is not here. Premise two, the best explanation for this is that my car has been stolen. Premise three, the best explanation is the most probable. Therefore, for conclusion, my car has probably been stolen. Now, if we're going to take on inference to the best explanation, it'll be weaker than abductive reasoning because we have to come to a conclusion that's the most probable explanation. Not that it's going to be the correct explanation or it has to be the case that my car has been stolen. There will always be that room for doubt. There may be some other explanation. And when we go through what makes an explanation the best explanation, we'll see why this is the case. So I argue that the best explanation will always have to be a probabilistic one. And this seems to be agreed in most of the sciences. They'll always deal with probabilities as opposed to certainty, um, which we'll also consider in the next slides. But this is the approach typically used in inference to the best explanation. So in order to accept the previous argument, we have to accept the premise that my car being stolen is the best explanation um, for my car not being here. And we can test this by different criteria. The first criterion which we need to use is test whether it's got explanatory power. A uh, explanation has explanatory power is when it actually explains um, what 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 needs to be explained, and it typically goes like this: we'll have the ex thing that needs to be explained, and then we'll say that this is what we'd expect if um, the explanation was true. So you can take a look at the argument's form as such. Premise one. If my car has been stolen, then it won't be here. Premise two, uh, so yes, premise two, it is not here. Therefore, conclusion three, it has been stolen. Now, if you remember from our conditional arguments, this actually commits the logical fallacy of affirming the consequent, because 
uh, there can be different explanations to um, why it's not here as opposed to it being stolen. It could be uh, my spouse has gone and taken it for a drive or I've forgotten where it's parked or um, and so on. Uh, so we need to be able to um, rule those out. Now, the argument alone doesn't rule it out, but what we can do is if we rule some of these other possibilities out, we can make it more probable that my car has been stolen because we can agree that it's something that we would accept, would expect if the car has been stolen, but we can acknowledge there are other possibilities. Um, so we need to rule those out. The problem will rise is that we're not going to be be able to rule out everything. We could, someone could say, well, you know, maybe aliens have vaporized the car into oblivion. Uh, there'll be certain explanations that can never be ruled out. That's why it is the fallacy of affirming the consequent. There'll always be some possibilities. So we're going to have to deal with um, those other possibilities that we cannot rule out. Another criterion for the best explanation is how testable it is or how falsifiable this is. This comes from a philosopher of science, Karl Popper, who um, he, he made an argument to find out whether something counts as scientific or unscientific is based on how testable or falsifiable it is. And that's when how easily um, we can rule out a uh, proposed explanation. Uh, so say we have the explanation uh, such as the aliens vaporizing the car. How testable is that really? I mean, okay, but what, um, what way can we rule that out? If, if say you could say the aliens are invisible in our space, they've got some holographic uh, technology that makes it impossible to detect. Um, it, it, it's not one we can easily rule out. Whereas with other explanations, say my spouse has taken it for a drive, I can give her a call and say, hey, where are you? Or, Have you taken the car? Or I can, if I'm parked at somewhere else, I can survey the area or think about where do I normally park it when I'm not parking it here. So those are, are much more testable um, and therefore much more falsifiable um, uh, explanations as opposed to the aliens vaporizing the car. Um, so that's the way we can tell um, whether it meets the criterion of being testable or falsifiable. Another criterion is uh, how well the explanation fits with our background knowledge. And that means how have things usually occurred in similar circumstances? We can think about the explanation that the car being stolen is that um, if you have somebody who has uh, come to retrieve their car and it's not there, normally what's usually occurred is the car has been stolen. But then there's other things that other competing explanations that will share that background knowledge, such as a spouse taking the car and has forgotten to tell you that they were going to take it, that that's happened. Um, but then you can compare with those different explanations of how does that, how often does that usually occur um, when we have um, uh, that thing needing explaining, which is the car not being here. How, what other things usually occur when you go to retrieve your car and it's not here? And that's where you can compare that to the uh, explanation of the aliens vaporizing the car is that's normally not usually occurs in those similar circumstances when we've go to retrieve our car and not and it's not there very rarely or not at all it occurs when aliens have vaporized the car the last criterion we'll cover today uh, just making a point that there's lots of criterion for inference to the best explanation we haven't covered all of them and many of these are in dispute by different scientists and philosophers on how much value they will hold on these uh, criteria um, but this is the last one we're going to cover today, which is simplicity. The uh, criterion of simplicity um, is, was popularized by William Ockham, which is uh, popularly, no popularly known as Ockham's Razor. Um, the idea of a simple explanation, which is what's favored, 
is it has the fewest number of additional assumptions. So when we're um, making an explanation based on something we have observed, which needs explaining, in this case, the car not being here, we're making assumptions about what has occurred or what hasn't been observed. And the thing that hasn't been observed in this case is the car being stolen. We didn't witness it ourselves. We're using it as an explanation for what we have observed, which is the car not being here. So that's the assumption we've made. Um, so if we have some things that will have additional assumptions, it makes the explanation more complicated or more complex than the other explanation, which is more simple. So we have the explanation that the car has been stolen. Now, say, for instance, um, we go with the alternative explanation that uh, the car has been um, borrowed by a spouse. Say, for instance, we give the spouse a call and say, um, hey, um, you know, have you got the car? And they call back and say, no, no, I haven't got the car. And then say someone who wants to really hang on to that explanation says, oh, maybe your spouse is playing a trick on you. Maybe they're trying to make you worried. So that's another assumption. So we've it's starting to become more complicated if we add additional assumptions. And we can make it even more complicated, say, with the alien example. We're saying, okay, there's aliens that have, been, that have vaporized it. Oh, okay, but, you know, there's no trace of that evidence. And then you go, oh, well, it's sucked up all the evidence of it being vaporized and it's, uh, you know, can't be detected by anything. These are all additional assumptions that we're making. So in we want to make this as simple as possible by keeping our assumptions to a minimum. So if we want to come to the best explanation, we have to compare all the criteria with one another. And this is not always so straightforward because you'll have sometimes the criteria that will conflict with one another. An example can be you could have a simple explanation which uh, doesn't have many assumptions, but it might be untestable or unfalsifiable. Uh, so sometimes they can be in conflict with one another. Uh, another way they may conflict is it might be um, have a lot of explanatory power. It might do all the job of explaining, but it might lack background knowledge. So th th these things can come up. You, so you, what you want to try to do is look at all of the criteria and uh, compare them to see which one satisfies uh, most of the criteria. What I've found is that most explanations that are seriously put forward will all have explanatory power. Because going back to it, if you've got good enough information, you'll be able to make it explanatory powerful. Um, you, you'll be able to think up all the circumstances to make it fit um, those things needing explaining. Um, so it's going to really come down to things like background knowledge, testability, and its simplicity. Um, so these, I find those are going to be the main things being considered, and you'll typically be able to use those to see that one that does the best. I tend to, when it comes to putting probability into the equation, I find testability to be quite a powerful one. But even then, there'll be some circumstances where there'll be a legitimate uh, explanation put forward and it might not be testable. Uh, so those things will uh, come up. And in those cases, you may need to start looking at how strong it is in its background knowledge and its uh, simplicity. So sometimes it's not straightforward, but it's good to know the um, kind of criteria that adds probability to an explanation. If you want more information, you can go onto the website www.philosophycriticalthinking.com and you can try out one of the test questions there. I'll read it in a bit more detail. Um, you, furthermore, you can uh, purchase the book, What is This Thing Called Science? by A.F. Chalmers. He, um, he uh, is, goes through these different ways we use explanations and how we um, think about science in far more depth and is a very good read, especially those of you who want to look further into the philosophy of science. Um, also, you can purchase the usual book I uh, push here, which is Understanding Arguments by Walter St. Armstrong and Robert Fogelin, where they go through their idea um, from inference to best explanation. 
If you want to stay tuned to the next video, we're going to focus on another aspect which is commonly used in science, which is the concepts of correlation and causation. If you want to stay tuned for that and more tutorials, please subscribe and click the bell. Thanks.